Okay, great. I can see the see the recording has started. Um, so, uh, good evening, good afternoon, and, and possibly also good morning to everyone, uh, depending where in the world you're joining us today. Uh, and, and a really warm welcome to everyone uh, for joining this this webinar on uh, sea level rise and coastal climate risks in in Bangladesh. Um, it's fantastic to see see those uh, who've joined already, and I know more people will be joining. So I hope you'll find it really an, an interesting and, and useful event. Um, and we do have a, a packed and exciting agenda over the next couple of hours. So I just want to uh, take a, a small bit of that time now to provide some some background to the event. And firstly, to introduce myself. Um, so my name is Joe Darren. I work as a science manager in the International Climate Services at the Memphis. And also leading the CARISA project, which is uh, part of the Asia Regional Resilience to a Changing Climate or ARC program funded by the UK's Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office. Uh, the CARISA project uh, under ARC is, is focusing on improving the uptake and, and use of climate change information across the South Asia region, but we're focusing on, on Bangladesh as well as Nepal, Afghanistan and, and Pakistan. Uh, and in November last year, colleagues um, Ben Harrison and Jenny Weeks, together with uh, Professor Saifal Islam from the, the Bangladesh University of Engineering and Technology. Uh, we led a training course on, on the sea level science for organizations in, in Bangladesh. Uh, following this event, Professor Saifal and ourselves agreed that now would be a really timely opportunity to, to hold a webinar to showcase more widely recent and ongoing research in, in the UK and Bangladesh on sea level science and coastal risks and also to promote discussion on integrating new information and science in policy and planning. And later this year there's crucial climate negotiations taking place in the UK at the 26th Conference of the Parties or COP26 under the UNFCCC and it's vital that these international as well as national and local policy decisions uh, to address climate change are, are informed by the best available evidence. We've seen uh, the value of science and evidence uh, in the responses uh, to the COVID-19 pandemic um, and, and so therefore we've wanted this event to, to help promote the use of evidence on sea level rise and coastal climate risks in policy and decision making but also to enable that that feedback in social processes we're developing uh, to make sure they best met, meet the needs of, of, of society. So to do this we've, we've got two parts to today. Part one will focus on a series of short talks um, chaired by Professor Saifal Islam and then the second part will be it will be a panel session and, and discussion uh, chaired by a Met Office, Met Office colleague uh, Tammy Janes. So finally, for starting a reminder to everyone to please keep your, your microphones muted and, and video switched off during the webinar. Uh, there will be opportunities throughout to ask questions um, and please use the, the chat function for this and, and session chairs uh, will we'll monitor this as we go. Uh, so thanks again for, for, for joining and um, I'm really thrilled now to hand over to Bangladesh to provide her opening remarks for the webinar today. Uh, so Judith, thanks, thanks so much for being able to join us today and uh, over to you. Thank you very much indeed, Darren. Good evening from Dhaka. I'm Judith Herbertson. I'm the Development Director here at the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office. It's an absolute pleasure to be with you and I'm very much looking forward to hearing the presentations and the discussion. This event is of particular interest for us for three reasons. Firstly, it's a great example of UK-Bangladesh cooperation on climate action. Secondly, it's a critically important issue for Bangladesh, two thirds of the land mass being less than five metres above sea level and 30% of the arable land being in coastal areas. And because thirdly, now more than ever, we have to use new evidence like this in policy making and planning. Last year, the UK and Bangladesh launched a climate partnership to share technical climate expertise and also our two countries have some of the world's leading climate scientists. Working together, we can harness this expertise for global good. As part of this, the British High Commission in Dhaka hosted the UK-Bangladesh Climate Partnership Forum linked to four of the COP26 campaign themes. Adaptation and resilience, nature, clean energy and finance. And these fora sparked collaboration between universities, 
energy providers, parliamentary groups, and there is ongoing discussion between centres of excellence, civil society groups, all in the run-up to COP26 and beyond, focused on tackling climate migration, climate finance, and the use of nature-based solutions, among others. The Asia Regional Resilience to a Changing Climate Partnership is an excellent example of taking forward the risk-informed early action partnership, which was launched at UNCAS in 2019, of which Bangladesh is a founding supporter. And we know that by improving forecasting and then converting climate information into services for those on the front line, the impact of disasters can be reduced. The UK is also hosting a climate and development ministerial on the 31st of March, which will explore some of the main challenges to financing climate action, which is becoming a much bigger crisis for us. And one of these will investigate how to improve financing for disaster risk and addressing loss and damage. We're looking forward to the government of Bangladesh's participation and hope that evidence of impact and climate information services can then be drawn on to find solutions that work here on the ground. We know that long-term sea level rise and coastal climate risks are of the utmost importance to Bangladesh. As Mr. Shafkat Munir of the Bangladesh Institute for Peace and Security Studies at the UN Security Council in February highlighted, sea level rise could potentially result in the displacement of 25 to 30 million people in Bangladesh, a major destabilizing factor, and not only for the Bangladesh um, nation, but for the wider region with significant security implications. Bangladesh is a crowded space already. That level of displacement carries enormous risks. So here at the FCDO, we're already working with coastal communities to improve their resilience. Our National Urban Poverty Reduction Programme works in towns and cities, either in coastal zones exposed to risks or those with high numbers of internal migrants already seeking better livelihoods, access to services. And the programme provides both structural innovations, such as embankments against erosion, and non-structural support, such as training for new income generating opportunities. And it does this by analysing, firstly, the exposure to risk, flood, cyclones, sea level rise, water logging, based on scientific evidence and assessments, and then the extent to which and the degree of exposure based on further vulnerability and resilience analysis. Community action plan priorities are then triangulated with available scientific assessments and validated by the relevant city or town disaster management committee. The program is also building nature-based solutions into coastal restoration, including wetland restoration and flooding risk mitigation. Our support to BRAC, the largest NGO in the world based here in Bangladesh, has also helped coastal communities to improve livelihoods and infrastructure to help the most vulnerable cope with the decline in freshwater availability due to the saltwater intrusion. So they're introducing reverse osmosis plants to supply drinking water, helping communities to switch to more salt tolerant crops. And the new predictions for sea level rise will help our programming to identify who is vulnerable to what, over what time frame and in what ways. We can't just guess at that or make it up as we go along. And from that, we can tailor adaptation techniques and make them more effective. Two examples, support for the expansion of seaweed cultivation instead of rice with mixed farming and aquaculture of salt tolerant shrimp and crabs. Or protecting the precious Sundarbans, the mangrove forest, which is already showing signs of dieback from extreme or prolonged inundation. So we're very keen to hear about climate services that can be de developed from new studies and then linked to financial assistance to increase the resilience of these coastal communities. And it's important that the information gets to them in time to take decisions about planting, irrigation, shading, harvesting for their crops 
and for aquaculture. It's very timely that these new predictions are available when Bangladesh is developing its national adaptation plan and revising its nationally determined contribution, both essential for COP26 and the future of climate action in Bangladesh, more importantly. So these are two very important policy shifts which have the potential to change Bangladesh's future. And I'm talking here again about the national adaptation plan and the nationally determined contribution, which can change Bangladesh's future from highly vulnerable and cold dependent to resilient and clean. Resilient and clean. This is a realistic vision for Bangladesh. Not only will new evidence inform big strategic decisions on funding, and emissions reductions, but it will also help target adaptation action to those most in need and to the impacts people are likely to experience. Through the Global Centre on Adaptation here in Dhaka, which opened just last year, Bangladesh is promoting locally led adaptation with communities and local authorities to ensure greater ownership and durability of the solutions. And this is crucially dependent on having the right information. Through the GCA and also its chairmanship of the Climate Vulnerable Forum, Bangladesh can be a very strong advocate for evidence in policy and planning and can also support regional cooperation through analysis, capacity building and dialogues. The region is vulnerable, not just Bangladesh. And as we know, climate change has no respect for national borders. In January, Bangladesh, through Salim ul Haq and his International Centre for Climate Change and Development, and forgive me, Salim, if you were going to say this yourself, hosted Gobeshuna, an annual conference focused on climate science and research, bringing together world experts on climate to share knowledge, inspire action and inform policy on locally led adaptation. So this event today, tonight, is another milestone on the road to COP26 so that we're as informed as possible of the challenges that lie ahead and how evidence and science can help us in tackling the crisis of the moment, as it did on COVID, as it has to do on climate change. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks so much, Judith. That's, uh, it's, it's, you know, fascinating to hear about the, the range of work that's the it's being done um, across Bangladesh, and as you as you rightly say, that it's 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 uh, these are problems that face the region and, and also elsewhere as well, and and the role that learning and we can have from Bangladesh can can help the wider region. Um, so uh, with that, now passing over to um, to Professor Saiful Islam for um, chairing the the, the talks um, today. So uh, Professor Saiful, uh, over to you. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Joseph uh, Darren, and uh, from UK Met Office at Lee Center. It was a really uh, exciting uh, webinar uh, today uh, because the issues that uh, we are uh, talking about or going to learn in uh, next uh, one and a half hour is sea level rise, which impacted Bangladesh a great deal. I think excellent introductory uh, remarks by Judith uh, from DFRD. It was really, uh, uh, I think, useful because Bangladesh has increasing its resilience uh, through different uh, programs. Uh, one of them, you mentioned that uh, we made a different policy and a strategy action plan in 2009, Bangladesh Climate Change Strategy Action Plan. Recently, we are updating uh, National Adaptation Plan. She also mentioned that we do the, our determined contributions uh, on time. And we also signatory of the Paris Climate uh, Agreement in 2015. So all this actually uh, set a path for Bangladesh to be more resilient. But uh, also at the same time, we uh, need global support for becoming uh, more resilient. Particularly, uh, Judith mentioned that sea level rise makes more vulnerable to the country. Uh, and also many other challenges uh, with the sea level rise, like uh, salinity intrusion, and also we see the different marine heat wave. Uh, she mentioned about Sundarbans, that also under big threat, and also the coral island. Um, uh, uh, also, um, we, uh, we face many different challenges. One of them also could be uh, ocean acidification that's going to be also 
create a lot of issue. And uh, if I talk about the last year, we see uh, two big uh, catastrophic events. One is Cyclone Amphan, which is super cyclone that hit uh, West Bengal and uh, part of Bangladesh. And also uh, we see the prolonged flood in 2020, uh, it's last more than uh, 40 days. So all this uh, natural disaster is likely to be uh, likely to be more intense and more durational. So I um, think there are more presentation coming in this session, uh, at least uh, four presentation. Uh, first, I request uh, first speaker uh, Ben Harrison from UK Met Office uh, to present and we should follow strictly the time uh, limit of uh, 10 minutes for each presentation and then followed by Bushra Duty and Dr. James Savis uh, and Dr. Lawrence together and then myself will show the satellite altimetry. So I pass it to the uh, uh, Benjamin Harrison So uh, for the first presentation. Uh, thank you. Hope you will enjoy his presentation. Thanks. Ben. Hello everyone. Uh, my name is Ben Harrison. Uh, thank you very much Saifal. Uh, thank, thanks everyone for joining us at this uh, this webinar on coastal climate risks uh, for Bangladesh. Uh, in a moment, I'm going to be sp speaking a bit about what climate projections can tell us uh, about sea level changes in Bangladesh, uh, and perhaps more importantly, what uh, what the climate projections can't tell us uh, about future changes in Bangladesh uh, and the other the other sources of information we might need to use to to improve the set of tools we have for responding to sea level rise. So bear with me, I'll just uh, share my screen. Right, can everyone, everyone see that? Yes, that's coming through, Ben, thanks. Okay, good. Uh, so, um, as Joe mentioned, uh, Joe is heading up the Carissa project, uh, which is um, looking to try and improve the uptake and use of, of climate projections uh, in kind of risk assessments uh, and climate adaptation. And I've been working on the the coastal element of that, which is focused on sea level rise as the main kind of driver of, of coastal coastal risks. Now, the UK is naturally interested in sea level rise as, a, as an island nation, and that's why our government uh, asked us to, to produce a new set of sea level projections for the UK, uh, which is called UK CP18. And we found even for a small country like the UK, uh, you actually see um, some important differences in sea level. Uh, in different parts of the country. As you heard from Judith though, uh, the UK is also interested in how sea level rise could impact uh, development in other parts of the world, including Bangladesh. Uh, so one of the things uh, I've been working on is a new set of sea level projections uh, for, for locations in Bangladesh as well as other regions. Uh, the general idea of our project is to kind of produce new information inputs that will help make decisions but also um, enhance the capacity of organisations in the region uh, to use and improve these information outputs, because I recognise that this is really just the, the first step in, in developing useful tools that can help uh, with adaptation. So the first uh, question we, we wanted to consider is, well, how much does sea level rise differ for Bangladesh compared to, to the rest of the world? Uh, and the reason this is important is because previously in the literature, we'd seen that uh, risk assessments and impact assessments for Bangladesh had tended to use global projections. So our first step was to see kind of how much do, do things actually differ. The reason this is important is this could lead to uh, an underestimate, underestimating the potential impacts or conversely um, kind of spending too much money on, on defences, for example. Uh, so these are the results from um, the projections that we've produced. The top one is Cox Bazaar in the Chittagong Coastal Plains. Uh, I won't go too much into it to the details, but effectively this, this kind of blue line represents the global projections, the kind of midpoint of the global projections, whereas the yellow uh, is, is for Cox Bazaar. So we see that actually 
at least as far as our, our models tell us, that the the projections are slightly lower uh, for Bangladesh, i.e., there's less uh, sea level change, um, and you also see this see this at the the lower end, um, and at least for the early part, it seems to to match up with our observations. So this black line is is the tide gauge, and the yellow and the grey line is the is the satellite observations. Um, and if you take this, isn't the true everywhere in South Asia. If you just take the Maldives, for example, you see actually uh, the opposite is the case, and there's actually a slight it's slightly higher than the global average. Hopefully that convinces you that uh, sea level rise is not the same everywhere. Uh, the next question we want to know is, well, how much difference is there within Bangladesh? Uh, so this this is important because you might want to prioritize a particular area of, of the coastline. So it could be the Sundarbans uh, that you want to protect the mangroves and you want to allocate some resources there, or, or perhaps you're concerned about the, the Chittagong coastal plains, for example. Uh, so when we looked into the, the processes, um, th these are the different contributions to sea level for, for Cox Bazaar um, in Bangladesh, and Diamond Harbour in West Bengal. And this was to get a sense of how much things vary uh, along, along um, the coast of Bay of Bengal for the last sort of 20 years of the 21st century. Uh, so the, the blue again is the global and the, the yellow is uh, the local. But um, if you just forget about the details for a moment, and essentially these look very similar um, apart from this one, one term, which is um, terrestrial water storage, which is related to, to how much water groundwater is extracted over the, the Eurasian landmass as a whole. And this really, really small term seems to be driving differences along um, along the coast of the Bay of Bengal. Uh, and it's not something we know, we understand very well, both in terms of what's already happened and uh, what will happen in the future. Uh, so here's actually a table of some projections for for um, tide gauge sites in, in the West Bengal and also uh, in Bangladesh. And generally there's an increase in the projections as we move east along the coast and then southwards along the Chittagong coastal plains. Uh, but this is this is only a few centimetres. Um, and actually, there's uh, when you look at the tide gauge records in the area, you see that the, the land is actually sinking um, quite quickly in some areas. And again, this, is, this isn't something that's um, that well uh, understood, which is why you have this large range. So it could be anywhere, for example, uh, here between sort of up to seven, 0.2 millimetres per year uh, and 2.4 uh, that the land is sinking over over the Sundarbans uh, and these are just estimates so it could be kind of more or less than that but there are essentially more significant sources of differences at the really local level that we can't yet uh, incorporate into our projections uh, and our, our, our predictions so that makes it difficult to prioritise different sections of coastline. Uh, so uh, I guess just to, to sort of summarise, um, I'm sure there'll be time for further discussion later, but we found that projected changes in Bangladesh are less than the global average. Uh, the changes tend to be driven by changes in, in the ocean um, circulation and density, but because they're the same everywhere, the differences along the coast are driven by this small term related to uh, groundwater use over the, the continent as a whole. Uh, the main source of uncertainty, though, like the global projections, is what happens in Antarctica, uh, because actually from the ice sheets, you see more of an increase in sea level around the equator than you do near the ice sheets. Um, and then an important point here is that the science is, is evolving and we're kind of improving our methods and observations. And so it's important to review previous coastal risk assessments, and particularly if these have been based on on global projections. Um, because this could change uh, the plan. And then finally, there are kind of very local um, sinking, sinking of the land, which can be much larger than the climate effects. Uh, and these, these are discontinuous and quite hard to, to model. Uh, so thank you very much uh, for listening. And for further information, uh, these are some of the outputs from the project that are available on the Carissa website. Thank you. 
Thank you, uh, Dr. Ben uh, Benjamin. Uh, it was really nice and informative and um, very good information uh, for regional sea level rise uh, over the Bay of Bengal, uh, particularly the along the coast and the projections for the future. And we also know the contribution from different component uh, 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 that actually make the variation. So um, we move to the next presentation, which will be uh, by uh, Bushra Duti from Institute of Water Modeling. Bushra, are you ready for the your presentation? Hello. Yes, we can hear yeah. you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Hello. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, uh, Joe, should I share from here or will you share with my presentation? Yes, you can, you can share. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so uh, uh, I am Bushra from Institute of Water Modeling. And uh, today I'll present about climate change, uh, sea level rise and adaptation strategies. I will uh, reflect a bit on from my experience. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, I am uh, I am presently working in the climate change cell of IWM and I have also work time to time with the Coast Port and Estuary Division. Um, I am basically a civil engineer with uh, 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 some background in water resource engineering and climate modeling. Uh, next slide, please. So, uh, all of us uh, mostly know about the global temperature changes in recent times, and uh, this has been equivocally agreed that uh, global temperature has been changing a lot due to human impact, and it is not the usual climate change case that we have seen over the different glacial periods. And uh, this has been agreed upon, also we see in different world agreements that the world is now working towards uh, climate change adaptation and mitigation so that we can uh, work to reduce the impact of climate change. Next slide, please. And sea level rise is a very big issue, especially for uh, countries like Bangladesh, uh, since it's a very low lying delta, of course, very driving forces working, but the globally available sea uh, height, the anomaly show that it has been increasing over the years, and this is very, uh, this is a very difficult case for Bangladesh. Next slide, please. So Bangladesh has a coastline of 710 kilometer. Uh, most most of the elevation is uh, very low. It is 62% of the area is below three meter elevation. A lot of the land area is poldered already. Uh, there is uh, 139 numbers of polder, that is coastal embankments that uh, has helped the agriculture to some extent, but now due to drainage issues, the polders also create uh, water logging issues and other problems because over the years, the drainage didn't work that well. So a lot of uh, engineering aspects or uh, social solution has come up out of it, like tidal river management, so that uh, the the polder water logging issue can be solved. And sea level rise is definitely a threat for our coastline, as well as uh, issues such as storm surge can also cause polder inundation. Next slide, please. So uh, I think also uh, Mr. Harrison also uh, said a bit of recent uh, subsidence issues that, that we see in the researches. Uh, the IPCC says that sea level rise will occur for RCP 8.5 up to about one meter by 2100. Uh, but uh, uh, when we look at the other parts like relative sea level rise, because the land is also subsiding, then that this can be even a bigger problem. Uh, see in the recent Becker report that over the last years, the water level in the Delta uh, increased slightly faster than other parts of the world, that is three millimeter per year, but also subsequently the Delta is subsiding 
from one to seven millimeter per year. And many other studies such as uh, uh, says uh, subsidence uh, rates for Sundarban specifically or for the entire Delta. Um, uh, uh, next slide, please. So to understand how the local sea level rise would be impacted, we have to understand different driving forces. We have to look at not only the absolute sea level rise, but also because the GBM is such a big basin, how the freshwater flow is changing. That is the basin-wise uh, metrology and hydrology, how the rainfall is changing. Um, if there is a seasonal or annual variation of the tide, tidal modulation, if there is um, any ENSO effect, that is El Nino La Nina effect in this area, uh, if there is change uh, in wind, that will cause change in the storm surge. So I, I agree with my, my previous reader that for the local, uh, there will be a lot of other impacts that will influence when we want to understand the local sea level rise dynamics. There is also sedimentation going on over the Sundarbans, so maybe Sundarban will rise a bit more, but other parts of Bangladesh will go lo lower. So these things need uh, further studies. Next slide, please. So uh, recently, IWM has started a project with the UK Met Office with uh, uh, funding from the United Kingdom uh, Financial authority FCDO. Uh, the objective of the study is uh, to investigate zone-wise and seasonal variation along the coast of Bangladesh and to understand sea level rise in near future as well as till 2100 uh, with, uh, in different climate scenarios. Um, so we want to look at the relative sea level rise along the coast. Also, since it is under the ARC program, uh, one of the ideas of the project is that we will effectively communicate the findings with the stakeholders so that it is uh, uh, the, the, the policymakers and decision makers uh, are aware of uh, the, the uh, scientific findings. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so there are a couple of um, uh, tools that is used uh, 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 for this, uh, for the purpose of finding along the coast uh, sea level rise. There is climate modeling, uh, downscale. There is the Ganges, Brahmaputra, Meghna. Then there is the river model, and then there is the Bay of Bengal model. So the idea is to find climate projections and then input them to uh, the sea level rise impact. In future, the sea level rise can be used for other impact models so that the impact on agriculture, uh, fisheries, agroeconomics, and with socioeconomic dimension, the other uh, impacts can be found out. Next slide, please. I will go a bit quickly here because this is a bit more technical. This is uh, focusing on IWM's uh, Ganges, Brahmaputra, Meghna Basin model, its coverage and different station points where we uh, calibrate the model with the uh, observed data set and uh, reanalysis data set so that this can be used for projection. Next slide, please. Uh, Bushra, uh, can the, you, Bushra, can you complete in uh, one minute? Thank you. Yeah, okay. Uh, similarly, this is for the one dimensional model. Next slide, please. And uh, also, we have it uh, for the Bay of Bengal model. You need to click uh, here a couple of times, Joe, because, yeah, for the animation. So, uh, when we go to the next slide, then I cover the adaptation part only. That's the last slide. Uh, Joe? Yeah. So uh, the, finally, the idea is that uh, we have to make in, uh, informed adaptation. So when we identify the hazard and then we identify 
This is not part process that in IWM we would like to follow for different projects that when you find the hazard, then you look into the impact and after impact investigation, you uh, understand what kind of adaptation and mitigation strategy you have to follow. And for this, there needs to be inter-institutional coordination and also uh, knowledge management, which helps in long-term, short-term, mid-term, long-term planning with the help of relevant policy guidelines and implementation. The adaptation pathway also helps understand how the policy response can initiate new impact, but also it helps in planned adaptation and mitigation. Uh, I think I will uh, finish here. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Bushra, for uh, your excellent presentation and explain the different activities carried out by Institute of Water Modeling and hopefully the project that you are collaborating with the MKMAT Office Headley Center will bring uh, very interesting results for this post. Uh, I would now request uh, next presentation from uh, University of Bristol, uh, Dr. Lawrence Hawaker, and also Dr. James Savage from Fathom. So, uh, Lawrence, you hear me? Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. 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 One second. Uh, uh, so, you have 10 minutes to uh, have your presentation. Thank you. Sure, okay. Uh, James, James is going to start off and then I'm going to um, carry on. So James, do you want to go? Yeah, um, I just can't see your screen right now. Okay. It was there a second ago, now it's just um, your initials. Um, okay. Do you see it or not? Yeah, 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 that's fine. Okay, right. So thanks everyone. So yeah, my name is Jane Savage and I work for Fathom. Um, for those who don't know, we're a research-based company that uh, undertakes flood modelling across the world, primarily focusing on national and global scale modelling. And I'm presenting with Dr Lawrence Hawker, postdoctoral top doctoral researcher from the University of Bristol. And so we're going to present some work exploring how population exposed to Anthem scale cyclones may change under future scenarios. And as you can see, the, this work's incorporated a number of people and organisations, so it's very much a collaborative piece of work. Um, so our overall aim here was really to try to understand what the impact would be if an Anfam scale cyclone happened again in a world with increased sea levels. And we do this by undertaking simulations of cyclone Anfam, incorporating estimates of sea level rise taken from climate models and the different future emission scenarios. And we combine these model simulations with estimates of future population change across the region to understand how population exposure may change in the future. So we realised that the same cyclone won't happen again in the future. Um, and there's a number of uncertainties in future climate that could affect both sea level rise and future cyclone behaviour. But we think it's an interesting attribution study to help understand um, potential future changes in flood risk um, for this type of event. Um, so a very quick bit of background as to why we've done this. Um, so Fathom and the University of Bristol, alongside some other organisations, are part of a pilot study to provide detailed flood risk information to the UK government or the FCDO and to help coordinate aid response on the ground um, following large cyclone events. As part of this, we undertook some coastal inundation modelling for the Bay of Bengal for Cyclone Ampan to help identify at-risk areas in advance of the cyclone making landfall. And we produced reports outlining flood risk and, and population exposure as shown in the images on the screen, um, which I'll go over in more detail in a minute. Um, and we then decided to take that modelling further to explore well, what would happen again if, if, if this cyclone happened in the future. Um, so to undertake the modelling for the present day, so we modelled time varying water heights along the coast using the Schism WWM type surge model uh, used by Legos. And this was forced of a combination of the Joint Typhoon Warming Centre best track estimate and the NOAA hurricane weather research and forecasting forecast. And we used these to provide boundary conditions of coastal water height to the Fathom flood inundation model to simulate inland inundation as a result of the storm surge. And we undertake our inundation modelling at 90 metres spatial resolution and we use the Merit DM to represent the terrain. Um, and so the map on the right shows the simulated flood hazard as a result of the storm surge event from the present day event. Um, we've also incorporated the height and location of flood defence polders in Bangladesh, which are broadly in the area within the red circle um, and shown in more detail on the next slide. Uh, so yeah, these are the outlines of all of the polders that we have. So we took 
the height and location of these and burnt these into the DEM um, to add the defences into our model. Um, we assume that the defences hold in our modelling, though we did develop an undefended model to see what would happen if the defences failed, um, but we're not presenting that here today. Um, so that purposes for We then use the hazard layers to calculate flood ex the population exposure. So we do this by combining the flood hazard outputs from the model um, with population exposure data sets. And so this map on the screen at the moment shows the outputs from this. Uh, so the colours of the different districts represent the percentage of the population that we were modelled to be exposed to flooding from the cyclone. And the size of the red circles indicate the numbers of people exposed to flooding. So you can see there are potentially quite large numbers of populations at risk, particularly around the Sundarbans areas. Um, so this was quite interesting and it was really important um, for the FCDO in terms of helping to coordinate aid response on the ground. Um, so for our future model simulations, um, to represent future sea level rise, we use CMIP6 future climate change models, and we take sea level rise projections from three future emission scenarios. So we take SSP1, a low emission scenario, SSP2, a business as usual emission scenario, and SSP5, which is a high emission scenario. Um, and for the Bay of Bengal, these cover a, a range of sea level rise projections from around uh, 0.3 to 0.9 metres. Um, and so for modelling the future flood hazard, we re-simulate AM, the AMFAM event um, with an uplift associated with the relevant sea level rise estimates for the different emission scenarios. It's worth uh, noting following Ben's presentation that we assume a uniform sea level rise here across the coast. So there's some uncertainty in that when you go down to a local level. Um, so I now that kind of covers the flood hazard approach. I'll now pass over to Lawrence to talk a bit more about how we calculate population exposure and how we estimate changes in future population and he'll also present some of the results from the modelling. So uh, by exposure, we mean uh, the number of people exposed to flooding, so not assets or crops or anything like that. Um, but we want to know what the future population might look like. Um, it's too simple just to simply, simply linearly interpolate population per grid cell. Um, so we kind of uh, developed a um, a, a gridding of future population projections and urbanisation rates um, for MIASA, um, which are available at a national level, um, and basically conditioned future population based on, um, on, on a pixel level. So what that looks like um, on a map, um, so this top plot here, plot A, is um, current day population, and this is based on um, some high resolution population rates population density map uh, data of 30 meters. Um, and then the bottom panel here, B, uh, shows the change. Um, so this is population predicted in the year 2100 um, for SSP5. Um, so in SSP5, the urbanization rate is 90% um, for 2100 compared to present day when it's about 33%. Um, and in this map, the red shows a decrease in population per pixel and the blue to the yellow shows an increase. So you can quite clearly see here that um, a lot more people are moving into um, urban areas. Uh, and to calculate exposure, um, it's a very simple, um, so it's a raster-based calculation. So you have population um, per grid cell. So, um, and then you have our flood layers. Um, so this is all upscale to 90 meters. And with our flood layers, we basically create a binary layer um, based on three different water depths. So um, low, um, low flooding, medium and high. Um, and then we simply multiply those together to get an exposure raster. And to make the results more meaningful, we sum this by administrative units. Um, so these are the sort of maps that we get. So on the left hand side is um, the present day uh, and fan um, sort of style um, exposure, which James presented before. And on this right hand side here, we have what they look like um, in 2100 for the different SSP scenarios. Um, so that's going to this A, C, and E here are the different flood extents, and B, D, F, and G are the exposure. Um, um, for, for, for those particular Amphan style events, but with a sea level rise and the population changes. Um, so the red dots, the size of the red dots, um, represent the number of population exposed. 
and the colors, uh, blue is a decrease in um, population exposed and the pink to uh, black is an increase. Um, so you can see in SSP1, for instance, there's actually quite a lot of decrease in, in general. Um, and then we aggregate these to a national level. So um, for the study, we, we did India and Bangladesh. So um, let's focus on Bangladesh for this presentation. Um, so we have the different flood depth thresholds here, um, 10 centimetres, metre and three metres. Um, and as we can see for the kind of low emission scenario, Paris Agreement, um, it's pretty much the change is quite insignificant, really. Um, but when we go for SSP 2 and 5, there's a big increase, uh, particularly for this low level of flooding, um, about 80% um, more people would be exposed. Um, yeah, so that's just kind of uh, going over that. Um, so most of the change in exposure is due to sea level rise, but um, change in population density is not insignificant. Um, these are the absolute numbers as well. Um, so, and this panel D, I should say, that's if you used present day population. So um, you can see kind of how the population has moved and how that um, has quite a significant difference on what the future exposure would be like. Um, finally, conclusions and perspectives. Um, so Cyclone and Amphan will remain, remain a unique event, of course, but it's useful to think of it um, for policy and to, to engage with, um, with people because they can quite easily relate to an event that's happened. Um, so this is not surprising, sea level rise increases future uh, flood exposure. Um, however, the future urbanisation um, results in less exposure. The population is generally moving away from um, the low lying regions. Um, into urban areas um, and so there's limited increase in exposure if you follow the low emission scenario um, kind of 0 to 20 percent increase um, however in high emission scenarios there between 700,000 to a million more people exposed uh, to cyclone at scale of Amphan. Um, the response is very non-linear um, and just a few caveats. So there's this this um, study was done in two weeks, literally just after Amfram. So it was um, yeah, there's kind of lots of caveats, but I think it's a good uh, port experiment anyway. Um, so there's uncertainty in the storm surge and coastal inundation modelling. There's limited flood defences, even though we did get quite a lot of polder information in the end. Um, no future flood defence changes. So the defence standard will almost certainly increase in the future. Um, there's large uncertainty in the the elevation data and um, sea level rise is not incorporated into population projections. So with sea level rise, people are very much more likely to move away from the coast. Um, but from the map, you can kind of see they, they did that anyway. Um, right, that's that's kind of us that's done. So if you've got any questions, just um, yeah, contact James or myself. Um, yeah, thanks. Thanks very much. Thank you, uh, James and uh, Lawrence, uh, for an excellent presentation on Cyclone Amphan and how it will be possibly changed in the future. So I like to start our presentation um, uh, right away, which is um, satellite altimetry. Um, using satellite altimetry, how the future sea level will uh, already the sea level has changed. So let me share the screen. Uh, is it uh, possible to see yes. the slides? Yeah, that's okay. coming Thanks. through. Yes. Ah, thank you. Uh, so uh, we did one project with the Department of Environment to use satellite altimetry data to observe the what are the observed changes of sea level rise in Bay of Bengal coast. And because uh, we did uh, a project before this project that was using the tide gaze data, what are the changes? Because there was no uh, good information about the trend of the uh, sea level, which uh, based on the tide gas data. So we studied that and completed and published that report in 2016. Uh, but unfortunately, the results are very high variation than the global sea level rise average, which is uh, in some part of the coast, we found seven to eight millimeter per year, and uh, some part is six to 10, and some areas we see the 11 to 21 millimeter rise in Chiragan coast, which is a huge spatial variation. And uh, one of the reasons is these tide gauges, which are located, also experiences some influence of the 
land subsidence that was mentioned by earlier speaker and also vertical uplifting and land accretion. So all this make it difficult to make the observations uh, accurate. And also we see the poor coverage of the special tide gauges, which is long term record. So if you see the special variation, this uh, west side of the Bangladesh, you see seven to eight millimeter per year. And then the central part is around like uh, six to 10. And then Chitang coast is very high uh, sea level rise observation. So this new project actually uh, using the uh, satellite altimetry data. And we are fortunate that we have a data set around 25 years since uh, uh, topics uh, procedures in 1992 and then uh, Jason 1 from 2000 to 2013 and the same track followed by Jason 2 in, from 2008 and then uh, Jason 3 is 2016 and now Sentinel 6 following the same track. So when you complete the study, we have only this uh, satellite data, about 25 years data. And these are the tracks that uh, these satellite images, uh, uh, satellite is passing through. Uh, we have a couple of tracks over this region, like 116, 92, uh, 014, uh, 90, 090, and uh, 106. Every 10 days they uh, pass through the same track. And using the data, uh, we uh, we found that the height anomaly, which is from altitude of satellite minus the range, which is uh, the microwave reflection height, half of the um, reflection height. And then uh, we uh, actually subtracted a number of uh, corrections that because it, uh, the, it's passing through the atmospheric uh, tropospheric correction we do because of the air density change. We also apply the um, vapor uh, correction, ionospheric correction and, uh, and uh, also the movement of the tide, uh, pressure and uh, other uh, uh, ocean states that after this correction applied, we found the uh, height anomaly, which actually transferred to sea level rise. So this figure shows how the uh, different corrections factor uh, changes with time. And uh, uh, once we found the uh, observed uh, sea level uh, from of 25 years data, we use the trend analysis called sense slope, which uh, do the trend uh, monotonic uh, trend analysis. And it's a robust non-parametric test which does not assume any distribution. And after that, we found this is the trend. And uh, it is vary from two to six millimeter per year, depending on the location of the Bay of Bengal. And uh, also this region has a seasonality of the sea level because of the monsoon, uh, during monsoon time, fresh water comes, which, uh, which actually influence the tidal constituent. So, uh, we found there is a seasonality issue, so we apply the uh, 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 significance. First of all, we apply the 95% significance, uh, which are the significant. Some area trend are not significant. Then we apply the seasonal man candle test. We found that values is slightly higher if we apply the seasonal man candle test. So, um, and uh, finally, we again apply the significance uh, interval, which is at 95% confidence level. Our result we produce is for each uh, point over this track. But uh, people wanted to do the spatial variation because that is also important. So we do the uh, spatial interpolation is geostatistical technique rigging and applying the rigging. These are the geospatial trend over the Bay of Bengal, which uh, shows that the variation is 2.5 to 6 millimeter depending on the location. And you see the near coast is more higher trend than other part, but some area we found that very uh, high trend as well. And after apply the uh, seasonality, we found the trend variation is like that. Then we found the uh, near coast as much prominent trend. And our uh, conclusion is that the average significant trend is 3.8 millimeter, uh, which uh, compared to the uh, uh, three to 3.6 millimeter for yearly uh, if we don't consider seasonality it's 3.8 millimeter and the maximum value we found around 6 millimeter uh, if we consider seasonality if not it's uh, 5 millimeter per year which is uh, much lesser than compared to the how to get the tide gas one of the 
reason is tide gas also include the contribution of the subsidence, which is uh, already Bulsh mentioned that it's one to seven millimeter. So that's why it's a, it's a, uh, it's a, from the uh, absolute sea level rise that we find from satellite altimetry data. And if you compare to the subsidence, we add that it will be much higher. We'll observe it could be more than 15 millimeter or higher. So um, I just show one or two uh, small uh, work that we've done in the, using the del 3D model. Uh, we found that in the Bay of Bengal region, if we consider around one meter sea level rise, it will be a permanent inundation about 3.8 percent and it will affect 6 million people. And if you have a uh, um, one meter uh, sea level rise and Sundarban will be affected or 42 percent and even it could be more if we uh, global uh, greenhouse gas emission will be higher. So um, that's it from my side. Uh, a few study we are still doing one of uh, the PhD student in the French Institute, he just defended his thesis. He showed the, how the tidal uh, constitute would vary in the future with the sea level rise. It is interesting that some area it will be, um, it will be more, uh, will feel more sea level rise. Some area will feel less uh, sea level rise because the tide will uh, aggravate or mitigate the sea level rise impact in the coast. And uh, Jamal Din Khan, has recently completed this study and submitted in the journal. Hopefully, if published, we'll share. And uh, that's it. Um, I close my um, presentation. Uh, let me. I hope I can do it from here. Uh, how to do it? I think. Yeah. Um, how to close the presentation? Can I close it, Darren? Uh, from I think uh, share, ah, yeah, yeah, okay. okay, yeah, thank you. And uh, so I close the presentation, okay, yes. Perfect. Many, many thanks, Saifal. And um, amazingly, we're, we're on time as well. So thank you so much for, <laughs> for um, yeah, your excellent chairing of the session. So um, there were a couple of questions in the, in the chat. Um, so uh, a couple uh, maybe um, for the previous speakers to refer to, but if there are any questions for Cyfal, then please do place the question um, uh, in the chat now. Um, and I mean, just a, just a reflection on, on the session as well. I think there's been uh, there's obviously a huge amount of uh, understanding building on 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 previous work, but it's, it's still growing understanding of of sea level and coastal risks in Bangladesh. So it's um, you know, keeping up with the advances in understanding and trying to embed them in the, in the decisions and, and the policies, both in terms of mitigation, but also uh, adaptation, um, I think is, is, is really key. Um, so we do, we're going to stop for a, a short break uh, before we uh, begin again um, for part two. Um, but um, Saifal, I'll just leave it, leave it to you for, for some final comments for that session. And if you um, want to address any of the um, questions that are coming through. Yeah, I, I, thank you, Darren. I saw a very interesting question and uh, some of them already answered. And uh, I saw one question from Professor Reza Rahman from Bangladesh about how Sundarban is helped. Uh, we saw uh, different times, uh, different cyclone like Cyclone Amphan and other two cyclones that was very helpful. And uh, because of the time limitation, uh, I think it is be uh, very useful if you write to us directly so that we can pass it to other presenter as well. And I like to thank all the presenter for excellent presentation. And I wish the next session will be much interesting. Uh, so we can take five minutes break there from here. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Saifal. And I can see Tariq, Tariq has a, a, a hand up, but if there's a, a question, please, please place it in the chat and then hopefully we can address that um, um, during the break. Um, so we're going to take a, a five minute um, break now, come back um, or potentially well, six or seven minutes. We've got an extra couple of minutes um, and then start again at um, 8.40 uh, Bangladesh time to 2.40 um, here, here in the UK. Um, and uh, the next session will be, be chaired by Tammy Jane. So I'll come online in a second to, to um, introduce that session. Um, but yeah, thanks everyone and see you again in, in six minutes time.
OK, well, welcome back, everybody. We're now going to start the second part of the webinar um, and to uh, chair this um, chair this part of the webinar. Um, Tamara Jones from the Met Office, um, who's a science manager um, in the International Applied Science team. Uh, she's also co-leading um, uh, another of the projects under the ARC program, the, the Skipsa project, um, which is more focused on the seasonal timescales. Um, but um, uh, Tammy has also worked in the region across a range of timescales uh, and um, is certainly a good person to, uh, to, to chair this discussion, which will um, hopefully get into um, a range of issues around the, the integration of research uh, into con policy and, and planning decisions. So uh, Tammy, thanks very much and I'll, I'll pass over to you. Thank you very much, Joe. Hi, everyone. Um, it's great to be here and an honour as well to have our panellists with us today um, if, in the hopes of a, quite a, a nice engaging discussion on embedding climate science into policy and planning in Bangladesh. Uh, before I introduce the panellists, if it's OK, um, I would just like to reiterate some things that Joe mentioned previously that um, if questions could be posed in the chat box, that would be really helpful. Then we can moderate the discussion um, as it progresses and make sure we keep to time. Um, also, if we can keep our microphones and videos um, on mute or off for the time being, that should help with uh, bandwidth capabilities as well. Um, and on with the show then, first what I would like to do is briefly introduce the three panellists that we have for our discussion today. And then I would like to pass to each of the panellists in turn just for a brief uh, minute or two introduction about your role and um, why you've chosen to speak on the panel today, if that's okay. So today we've got Professor uh, Salim al Haq, who is the director of the International Centre for Climate Change and Development in Bangladesh. <coughs> we also have Dr Mizan, the additional director general of the Bangladesh Water Development Board. And as well, we've got with us Professor Jason Lowe, a principal fellow at the Met Office in the United Kingdom. So if I could pass firstly uh, to Professor Huck, if that's okay, if you could give us just a brief uh, one minute introduction um, to yourself and your motivation for being here today, that would be great. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Salim al Haq. I'm the director of the International Center for Climate Change and Development at the Independent University Bangladesh here in Dhaka, Bangladesh. And I'm very pleased to be invited. I'm here because I was invited, but I'm very interested in learning more about the uh, research that's being conducted and presented. Thank you. Thank you very much. Could I pass to Dr. Mizan? Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Amir. Uh, uh, can you hear me? Or? Yes. Go yes, ahead. we can. Uh, one minute. I'm getting echo here. Okay, fine. Actually, I'm I'm uh, uh, MD Mizanur Rahman. I'm Editor Director General Planning, Design and Research in Bangladesh Water Development Board. Uh, just immediately, immediate past, I was project director, but uh, CIP one. And uh, before that, uh, I worked in Bangladesh Delta Plan Formulation Project, that is BDP 2100 as project director. So I am now very much delighted to get your invitation to attend this a program. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Mazan. Um, and Professor Jason Lowe, please. Thank you, Tammy. Um, good afternoon or good evening, depending on which which zone you're in. Um, so for much of my week, I work for the Met Office as a principal fellow and head of climate services. Um, for part of my week, I'm also uh, chair in interdisciplinary climate research at the Priestley Centre, University of Leeds. Um, I'm interested in both the science aspect, but also the pull through of the science. And I do quite a lot of work in the, the UK, um, working with government stakeholders in particular, um, trying to make the science more usable. So today I'd really like to, to see if there are, are lessons I can take back to the, the UK um, and any ideas I can share from the, the UK. That's great. Thank you very much, Jason. So to kick off the discussion, what I'd, what I'd like to do is propose uh, an introductory question to Professor Huck, if that's OK. Um, so specifically related to development activities in Bangladesh. 
What do you think the biggest challenges are for incorporating new climate evidence um, into these development activities within the country? Thank you very much, uh, Tamara, for that uh, question. So let me start by saying that um, high quality research is indeed extremely useful, but just publications in high quality international scientific journals are actually not at all the means by which any development policymaker, decision maker or practitioner in Bangladesh will even understand even if they were given uh, the article to read. So there has to be a significant effort from the researcher side if they want to make their research uh, amenable to understanding and use by others. Um, how long do you want me to talk about? As, as, as long as you're passionate to do so. OK, <laughs> OK, well, let me let me share three lessons that we've learned in in doing this. Um, the first one is that, uh, um, as I said, you know, your research uh, scientific paper is worthless as a tool of communication. It's useful in an academic setting, obviously, but it is worthless in the setting of trying to influence decision making in Bangladesh. What you need to do is to convert it into some kind of a more generally understandable product, which a lot of researchers now do. Um, you know, a policy brief, hold a seminar. Those are very useful, but they're really not enough uh, because what happens when you do that is they come, they listen to you and they really don't know what the hell they're supposed to do. They've listened, they heard you. It's interesting. You may have impressed them, but they don't know what else to do. So if you really wanted to uh, affect their decision making and, and uh, engage them in doing something with the research findings that you have produced, then you have to invest in building relationships with them. And it's a longer term investment than simply doing writing a policy brief and having a seminar. Um, and that's what we do. We spend a lot of time engaging with uh, key decision makers in this case in Bangladesh, particularly the planning commission who are in charge of our Delta plan and, and other plans. We just heard from Dr. Mizan Rahman. He was one of the, uh, the in charge of the Delta plan for them. And what we what we have is that we have a memorandum of understanding with them whereby once a month we hold what we call a learning hub event with the General Economics Division of the Planning Commission, which is the main body that does these plans. And we bring science scientists to come and present work to them, but in a in a manner that explains what they're doing and allows a lot of questioning to understand so that people can have an understanding of what they are hearing, ask questions. So it's a, a two and a half hour long program, half an hour for presentation and two hours for discussion, questions, debate, and no question is too stupid. You have to answer everything and explain it if you have to. Um, we actually advise the presenters on how to present uh, because present scientists tend to over present the details of the science. You know, I just saw a few very excellent presentations, but they went over my head. Um, so uh, you need to realize that you need to give the essence of the messages of your research, not the details of how you did the research, which is what scientists like talking about. And so they need to be trained. They need to be guided in terms of presentation. And and also what we do is we only hold the event when the uh, the member planning, who is the senior most official, actually is present himself, hosts and chairs the session. That ensures everybody else turns up and participates and he listens and he then comments and gives his views at the end. And that is a very effective way that we have been able to do this. We've done, done this for over a year and a half. We agree with them on the topic, the expert. If any of your experts would like to give a presentation, please let me know. We'd be very happy to facilitate it, but it needs facilitation. If you just go and give them a talk, it's not going to work. I can tell you that the presentations we just saw will simply go over their heads. They will not understand anything that you have said. And so there has to be an, an investment in building relationships, putting uh, material in a manner that can be used and continuing relationships with the uh, people uh, that you are trying to influence. And that's my last point where they have to be part of the process. Don't come to the decision maker at the end of your research. 
bring them in on the beginning of your research and tell them this is what we're trying to do. What do you think? And then along the way, make them co-owners of the product of the research and not just recipients of the product that the researchers have produced. And that that too often is the paradigm under which we researchers, uh, you know, we want to do our research, we bring it out and then we go and talk to somebody that we think should do something with it. Um, doesn't work that way. It is very ineffective as a means of communication. You have to invest in communicating properly, building relationships and getting trust. Thank you. I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Professor Huck. I think, <clears throat> pardon me, a lot of your comments there really hit home with a lot of work that we do and, and particularly around the importance on cultivating that safe space and that safe environment where we can engage with people on a, on a common ground. I think is is absolutely essential and i feel like the the climate science community we're we're riding a, a a tide i would say where the way that we approach our work is changing and the way that we uh, approach engaging with decision makers we are turning that slowly on its head where we engage like to engage first if possible so at every point you've made there really hits home for the work that we do so thank you very much i'd like to also pose a similar question to dr mazan if that's okay um so thinking, thinking specifically around your organization's role in the um, water management and, and water uh, development, do you also experience similar challenges in embedding climate science into, into the decision making that happens within your organization as well? And is there anything that climate scientists could really do better in your eyes for engaging that, that part of the decision making spectrum? Yes, thank you, Dr. Tamara Jain. Actually, uh, I am every day afraid to talk here along with our eminent scientist, Professor Solimul Haq. Uh, he is here, he, he can speak uh, nicely on, on, on uh, climate change risk in Bangladesh because he's working a uh, long time. He was also one of our uh, uh, big con contributor in Bangladesh Delta Plan formulation project. Actually, uh, historically, uh, the marshy coastal belt in Bangladesh was an agriculture unproductive. Semi saline wetland whose sparse population was dominated by fishermen. Then, uh, during the Jomindar's period uh, 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 in 19th century, the population grown here. And uh, 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 through that uh, Jomindar system, uh, there were uh, 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 many dikes were uh, developed in the coastal zone to get more food. And uh, at Jomindar, they uh, maintained the dikes through uh, compulsory people participation. Uh, but uh, that uh, Jomindar system was uh, abolished in 1931. And the total amendment uh, operation and maintenance system was stopped during that time. But uh, uh, during that, you know, during that 1960s, that is 60s decade, coastal amendment project introduced in Bangladesh through many uh, foreign uh, donors. And uh, during that time, uh, that coastal uh, amendment project only supported the uh, SARS, that is, uh, that is a tidal boards only to uh, control the salinity in Tusha and uh, just to save the agricultural product with uh, one in 10 years return period uh, design level. And also uh, drainage sluices and uh, uh, irrigation system by flushing sluices were also provided during that time. But in 1970, uh, uh, World Bank realized that uh, uh, internal water management uh, um, through people's participation in coastal amendment project should be there. Consequently, uh, actually, in uh, after 1974, uh, there was a, there were there was a big flood in Bangladesh, and some uh, famine was there. During that time, government requested World Bank and the Netherlands government to provide a very quick implementation project uh, so that. Uh, uh, food and agricultural product can be saved. Through that, uh, during that time, uh, early implementation project, you know, early implementation project were implemented in 1975 to 1992. Uh, in that project, people's participation in different folder were uh, introduced. 
and uh, during that time actually uh, before 1975 there were only 46 folders and after 1975 it grown uh, to uh, 126 and amendment uh, length uh, 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 increased uh, to uh, 4800 kilometers from 2600 kilometers uh, and after 1984, uh, you know, they are 85, there are a big cyclone. And then uh, next uh, consecutive years, say 1988, 1991, there were floods, uh, uh, cyclones, and big havoc were in the coastal, coastal zone, big disasters. Through those uh, 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 disasters, government conceptualized to rehabilitate all the 126 folders and the CERP, Coastal Amendment Improve, uh, Rehabilitation Project were introduced mm -hmm. and it was uh, um, continued till 2003 and about 21 folders were uh, rehabilitated. And in those folders, uh, in those folders, some cyclone protection uh, measures were given, but not any, uh, any uh, climate resilience uh, activities were there. After that, uh, there were system rehabilitation project, uh, uh, if some project, that is, if some means integrated planning for sustainable water management project, these were mainly concentrated for people's participation and rehabilitation of existing folders. And the simultaneously uh, integrated uh, coastal zone management uh, program also there, through which some uh, integrated approach were there in in, in uh, uh, coastal zone management. But uh, during that time also, we did not get any uh, re climate resilience uh, decision or climate resilience uh, uh, program uh, from the uh, donor or from the government part. The, uh, after uh, after uh, CEDAR and uh, ILA, there was uh, an emergency 2007 cyclone recovery restoration project who is covered only uh, dam damage uh, uh, recovery from the damage to livelihood and infrastructures. Uh, uh, and during this, in this project, that is the CRRP project, Emergency Cyclone Recovery Restoration Project, through that project, one study was there for uh, uh, coastal amendment improvement project. In this coastal amendment project, our main objective was to uh, uh, to uh, object was the resilience of coastal population to natural disaster and climate change. And perhaps this is the first climate resilience project in coast of Bangladesh. And objective of this uh, 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 was uh, strengthening and upgrading the embankments to protect the SARS level and the sea level rise considering the um, climate change for future 50 years and uh, the, this uh, this uh, CIP project was also having one long term monitoring research and analysis uh, study uh, for coastal dynamic uh, analysis in Bangladesh considering climate change uh, for next 20 years and for, a, for preparing a future coastal development plan and uh, finally uh, you know, Bangladesh government has introduced Bangladesh Delta Plan 2100, considering the principles uh, that is the living with nature and nature based uh, solution first, no regret measures, economic growth and sustainability and and climate change adaptation pathway. And this is the uh, 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 main document for Bangladesh government for considering the climate change risk uh, through this Bangladesh Delta Plan to 2100. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Mazan. It's really interesting to hear that historical context and how things have evolved in recent decades and how much the scientific impact has been fed in slowly with time. Um, but really reassuring to hear about this, about the Delta plan, and particularly around the notion of no regret options as well. That's something that's quite interesting, given that I think as, as scientists, we're often grappling with the wealth of uncertainty within climate projections and how to, how to really grasp that and communicate that into actionable plans. It's fantastic to see that we're also looking at the, 
the potential for no regret options as well in there. That's great. I'd like to have a follow on question as well to uh, Professor Lowe, if that's OK. Um, I'm, I'm keen to know in your experience um, how you've found this embedding process within the UK context and particularly around working with UK government as well. Yeah, I mean, the first thing that that struck me listening to both of the first two answers um, is how universal some of the challenges are um, in doing this. I, I very much recognised um, the same barriers. Um, we see those in the in the UK as well. I mean, when I think of the process here, I mean, firstly, there there are some elements of the science we need to we need to get right. And over time, I think we're getting better. Um, but there's still a way to go. I mean, we have to make sure that we're providing science that is credible. We need to make sure we're providing science that's relevant. We need to make sure we're providing science that's not just useful, but usable. Um, and that's the minimum um, that we start to do. When we go beyond that, um, we get into the type of process that was referred to as um, as co-production. And I think the situation has evolved, certainly in the in the UK around co-production. Um, I recently went back to some of the earlier literature, um, not from climate, but co-production in other other fields, um, reading some of the papers from the late 1960s. And what really struck me is how ideas like the, the ladder of participation are really relevant to what we're now doing in climate. So I think from, we've been through a phase where we didn't really have the co-production step um, and that's going back probably 20, 25 years. Then we went through a phase where you might describe it almost as tokenism. Um, we'd say, is our result relevant? Um, well, yes, we write a report and we, we, we hand it to a funder, but that's not really exploring the relevance. Um, and now we've entered the, the co-production phase. So with the co-production phase, there are several aspects to that as well. There's involving the policymaker um, in terms of understanding and tailoring the results, but that's kind of weak co-production. Um, the the deeper co-production, I think, is where we're we're starting to see. So in projects like the UK climate projections, what we tried to do there was at the very early stage in the uh, in the project, identify who our government customers were and what decisions they were making and also do the same for um, other potential users. So there are other organisations, some of which might sell climate services to to other companies. Some might be end users like utility companies that that want to know if they're protected at the coast. And we got them together early on and tried to understand those decisions and what they would need. Um, and then as we went through the production of our our UK scenarios, we consulted with them and involved them in some of the, the key decisions. Um, and then it, it doesn't stop even when you've produced the results. It's, it's kind of only just beginning then. Um, and so we spend quite a lot of time um, working with many of the people who, who want to use um, the climate information now that it's produced, um, trying to, to figure out the best ways of using it, how to get the most um, from the climate data and that might be um, trying to understand how we we treat uncertainty it might be trying to deal with the the challenge that users quite rightly um, are adapting at particular locations so we need place-based information um, and trying to figure out how we can we can best deliver that and so the relationship goes on and i think what's really exciting for me is it's feeding back into the fundamental science as well. So it's affecting how we think about designing our climate models. What, what do we prioritise in our experimental setups? Is it more complexity? Is it a greater resolution? Is it ability to produce more ensembles? Or is it something completely different? Um, I think there's still quite a long way to go. Um, and I think there's a there's a need to to recognise that decisions are not made in in isolation. Climate is just one factor um, and trying to understand how these other components of the decision link to um, to the climate aspects. As climate scientists, we think oh, climate is the, 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 the most relevant. 
it is a relevant component but we also need to know how it how it relates to other facets of the of the decision and i think finally i'll say we we don't do enough yet on thinking about why adaptations don't happen why is the climate information not used even when it's understood and that idea of understanding the barriers um, is something that certainly is being talked about in UK adaptation um, but understanding how to overcome them for instance talking more about the co-benefits thinking more about how we mobilize finance um, those are aspects that are still a work in progress in my view Great, thank you very much, Professor Lowe. I think your your final points there again really hit the nail on the head um, around understanding that full decision space and that full decision context. That climate information is but one part of that entire process, um, and there are so many other factors at play there. And 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 as you say, there are definitely things that we can continually do better um, across the board. So, looking forward to seeing how those developments occur. We've got a question in the chat box um, that has propped up for Professor Huck, if that's okay. Um, do we still have Professor Huck? I should check because I know that um, his time was limited. I'm afraid, I'm afraid he's just had to leave, so ah. we'll have to follow up those questions <laughs> right. after this. <laughs> that is fine. Um, so looking on to see, um, I wonder if uh, Ben, your question around lifetime of the um, embankments of the polders. I wonder if you would be happy to ask that directly to Dr. Mazan. I'm, I'm guessing that's who the intended recipient would be. Uh, yes, Tammy. Um, Thank you. Yeah, uh, Dr. Mazan, I was I was just asking in the chat um, how long the, the polders are expected to to be effective, um, and whether that's actually the same as how long they remain in place. Uh, and by no regret. Does that mean that these structures are easy to to modify? Is that thought about as part of the design? Hopefully that's clear. Dr. Mazan, are you OK to? Oh, we see you coming up. There we go. Sorry. Thank so you. Can you can you repeat the question again? Uh, yes, so uh, so the question is, how um, how long do the polders remain in place or remain effective and are yeah, are they yeah. flexible that you can upgrade them easily or it's it's a good question actually you see it depends on the uh, public requirement say uh, if public are depend dependent on that uh, agriculture and coastal resources then it will remain uh, long time, maybe renovation or rehabilitation will be required according to the economic condition of the public. So, so in the beginning, uh, you see, as I already informed that in the beginning, it was only for to protect the agriculture from tidal blow. Then uh, cyclone was introduced to protect the cyclone. Now oh, we are introducing the climate change risk. And uh, we are projecting the climate change for next 50 years and considering that uh, change, uh, in, uh, say sea level rise, land subsidence, uh, SARS, increased height of SARS, everything we are increasing. And demand is there, you see, uh, during the last uh, uh, Ampan, approach to relief. At that time, they told. No, we don't we need relief, we need embankment. So this is the requirement of the embankment. So, so long people will be required the embankment, if uh, embankment will remain over there. Maybe technical aspect will be there, earthen embankment will be replaced by uh, other materials. That depends on our, econ our economy and uh, uh, condition of the cost of the project. Thank you. Thank you very much for, uh, for answering the question. Thank you, Ben, and thank you, Dr. Mazan, for that um, useful response. What I'd like to do is actually uh, redirect one of the questions that was meant um, for Professor Huck actually to Professor Lowe, if that's OK, because I think it's something that is actually applicable across the board, really. Um, the main question, I've got to scroll up now, sorry. <laughs> 
the the question was what would be your suggested approach on collaborating with decision makers particularly from a funding of science perspective which is perhaps a strong wall to break into sometimes yeah definitely um i mean so this there's there's two aspects to that there's there's the collaborating with decision makers and there's the funding aspect um, and you can almost picture this as a Venn diagram um, with two two overlapping circles. So I'll start with the um, the collaborating with policymakers, then I'll come on to the funding and then we'll talk about the overlap. So collaborating with policymakers. Um, I find in the UK there's no shortage of policymakers who um, will say I would like I would like to talk to you. I'd like to talk about climate. Um, and I think that's just because it's it's so high on the, the agenda. Um, the difficulty then though is getting to that meaningful dialogue we talked about earlier. Uh, and I think the biggest barrier is time. Um, and because so many of the people who make policy or planning decisions, um, they're faced with um, a multitude of policy questions coming their way. Um, it's difficult sometimes for them to, to be able to figure out um, where to put that time. So it really helps actually if the community can organise itself, can help to synthesise that message, can, um, can speak with a voice and be clear on what we know as a community what we don't know um, and what we think we know. And that's a kind of a way of, of picking at the, the uncertainty and the level of confidence. Um, I think it helps um, if we can think about the timeliness of our results. So policy goes through a range of, of different cycles in the, in the UK. Um, one of those that is rela related to the Climate Change Act in 2008 is the cycle around climate change risk assessment and then national adaptation planning. Um, there are also cycles, for instance, around um, water resource management planning um, and adaptation reporting. And using that information carefully and so understanding when particular issues are going to be relevant to policymakers lets us target um, what we can contribute to the debate um, at the most the most relevant time and make it as easy as possible um, to, to to make the engagement happen but ultimately you need a long-term relationship and um, the time invested in that um, is well worth it from from both sides I think. Let's come across to the funding. Um, so where does where does funding come from for the type of research we're talking about here? Well some of it comes directly from uh, from government. Um, so in the UK for instance the government funds the Mess Office Hadley Centre climate program um, and also programs like ARC or, or WISER that look further afield. Um, it's it's useful to be able to to kind of demonstrate even before those programs are thought about where the research gaps are and that can help um, when policymakers are thinking where best to to spend their limited limited funding um, it can help them understand where the the gaps are so again getting in right at the start of the the process can help um, there are other ways of course funding is allocated. It's allocated, for instance, through research councils and in the UK, um, UKRI um, takes a, an overview of where those those gaps are and then individual research um, councils in different disciplines um, will take some of that research forward. Um, so making sure that, again, the the gaps and the need and the timeliness is feeding through to the research councils and when a piece of existing research finishes um, actually demonstrating how it was used um, and where the socioeconomic benefit has, has come from um, really helps with follow-on research and then when it comes to trying to trying to actually get funding for the new research, thinking in terms of, OK, what is the scientific advance? But how will we demonstrate impact? How will we achieve impact and how will we measure impact? Um, and I think one of the the developments we're seeing 
in the UK, but also in, in many other countries, is this need for better tracking um, and figuring out what the right indicators are. And I think increasingly we'll see that that steering funding. Um, we also need to realise that sometimes our debate um, gets a little bit too narrow. Um, and so thinking even about adaptation um, on its own, I think is um, is probably too narrow and it's too narrow for many of our, our funders. Um, so if we're thinking about climate, we should be thinking about mitigation and adaptation together. Um, but actually, we should probably be thinking further. We should be thinking about development. Um, and by doing that, it suddenly becomes a lot more obvious where some of the, the science that we need becomes relevant to this whole range of decisions. Um, and I think that helps um, helps generate and helps focus the funding. Um, then the final bit of the answer is the private sector. So we shouldn't assume that um, the public sector can necessarily solve, solve all of this. And we need to understand ways um, that the private sector can be brought in. Now that's not just providing opportunities to, to do further research and application. Um, it's also thinking about how organisations um, can start to take climate risk and environmental risk more seriously and make sure it's on their risk registers, for instance. And we're seeing that type of process happen through um, national banks and the stress testing approaches that um, are starting to appear around um, around the world in, 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 in several different contexts, but ultimately they're about understanding where assets are exposed and businesses are exposed. Um, and I think that's a key part of building resilience and bringing funding into um, filling, filling the gaps around knowledge that make it possible. Thank you very much. Yeah, that's that's a really comprehensive answer. And I think particularly touching on the, the aspect of that diversity of funding options, I think often, often scientists, we can get stuck in the mind frame of our work needs to be funded by UK government or research councils and that sort of thing. But you're absolutely right that private, se private sector funding opens up such a wealth of opportunity to embed that science in completely different ways as well and progress that thinking. So that's fantastic. Thank you. We've got time for a couple more questions here. We've got one in the chat box now um, for Dr. Mizan. Um, so for some of the more transformational adaptation options, um, i.e. no regret, but high regret decisions, not no regret, sorry, but high regret decisions, in national interventions such as the uh, 2100 plan, to what extent does scientific evidence, such as rate of sea level change from future projections, help shape those decisions? So that's a question to Dr. Mizan, please. Yes, actually, uh, in our 100 years uh, plan, we have uh, some slot that is short term, mid term and long term. Actually, the short term uh, plans are no regret plans, uh, but uh, the long term plans are uh, flexible. Time to time it will be changed and it is a living document. So we'll not tell that long term plans are no, no regret. Done. So, okay. Maybe if I can just follow up briefly on that question, Tammy, if that's okay. Yes, please do. Yep. Yeah, I think I, 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 um, yeah, no, that's interesting to hear about the sort of different time scale of the of the questions uh, of the of the uh, solutions. I, I guess part of my question was motivated by asking for those long term plans. Are there thresholds at which um, some of those more uh, it's sort of transformational decisions that that would impact um, communities in in potentially different ways. Would they would the, are those thresholds known? And how does the the scientific evidence and the changing scientific evidence around sea level rise uh, and and coastal risks? How does that help determine whether those thresholds are crossed and and sort of uh, sort of more robust interventions might need to be planned? Um, if that makes sense, I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not yes, sure the yes, question. Yes, actually, actually there is a monitoring uh, plan in our uh, Bangladesh Delta Plan or formulation project. Monitoring is there uh, to get the threshold value. That is the index. We tell it is in the in index. We have result framework, and uh, uh, through that result framework, we will find out the uh, threshold level 
the, this is the uh, our uh, our say flood. We have now uh, seven the uh, seventy percent uh, that is a thirty percent flood plain in Bangladesh. It is a normal flood uh, every every year. Uh, Bangladesh is being inundated thirty percent. So our our uh, target is uh, to reduce it twenty five percent within next ten years or twenty years. So that that should be monitored in this way. All sorts of our scientific uh, index will be monitored. I think it's OK or. Yeah, no, that's that's very helpful. Yeah, I think um, yeah, tying in the monitoring with the information about future projections and, and, and the modeling work is is yeah, is key. Yeah, thank you for that. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, thank you. Could I come in briefly with the the UK experience? Because again, it's it's one of those areas where there's a, a really interesting parallel, I think. And I, I'm instantly minded of um, the work around the, the Thames barrier. Um, so the Thames barrier, um, it was opened in the, the 1980s, um, but already by the early 2000s, we were starting to ask the question of how long will it last? How long will it be, be suitable for? Um, and that it was very much decided at an early stage that um, the, the approach that would be followed be, would be one of flexible adaptation um, and once you start to go down that route it means the type of scientific information and the way you use for instance um, models of the climate becomes different um, so in the in the Thames estuary plan the questions we were effectively trying to answer was firstly what is the the most likely amount of, of sea level rise um, over a period because that's where um, you would you would actively start to plan for. You might not need to implement your options, but you would you would start to plan along that route. But then we also need information on well, what's the highest potential um, change in sea level? Um, we also looked at the maximum change in, in river flow. But if we focus on sea level, um, there we had to go. Um, really into the tails of the uncertainty distribution of sea level um, and combine what we were getting from the computer models with other strands of evidence um, such as paleo um, climate results and just thinking about the the limiting physics and often when you go into the tails there, there is a lower confidence in those strands of information um, and there was quite a um, quite 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 a learning exercise of trying to to work with the decision makers to say, well, look, this is not what we think will happen, but this is what we can't rule out. And then the um, the colleagues we had who worked for the Environment Agency, they had a list of options that went all the way up to these maximum values. Now they didn't um, actively plan to go for the um, the highest interventions, but it meant they were making sure that they didn't rule them out so they didn't build um, on land close to the river where they might need a, an outer barrage in future. Um, but the other thing it, it did was make us think a lot more about the idea of early warning and it's not just thinking about well we need to monitor sea level um, to understand what's what's going to happen. Um, we can use the fact that we've got a new generation of earth system models to say well okay where do the the signals first appear perhaps we should be looking in ice sheet models to see if there's an acceleration of of um uh, the contribution from the antarctic ice sheet but well actually maybe we can even go um beyond that we can think about what drives that change and so we can use the models in a different way um but then the question starts to change supposing you go through time and um the rate of sea level rise is increasing, then the amount of time you will have to implement an option also changes. So you have to update um, as well as your understanding of the climate projections, where climate is now, but your understanding of what options are, are possible um, and what their, their costs and benefits and co-benefits are. Um, and it just completely turns decision making, I think, the, the opposite way up. Um, and I'm, I, I'm, I'm guessing, and from what I've, I've seen um, of the, the slides earlier, that we're facing exactly the same sort of, of difficult ways of interpreting flexible adaptation 
and flexible decision making um, wherever it's applied. Thank you very much. That was yeah, a fantastic joint effort there. Um, the question. I think we're we've got about five minutes left. So what I would like to do there is one final question um, that I would like to pose to Professor Lowe, if that's OK. And then any questions that we haven't been able to tackle in this session, uh, the Met Office team will do our best to make sure that we will endeavour to get you some answers somehow, <laughs> whether that be remotely or through email. So for the final question, if that's OK, um, posing to Jason, a lot of the conversation has been about climate science feeding directly to policymakers and public public private end users. Can you reflect on how effectively climate science researchers are collaborating with researchers in other social economic areas relevant to adaptation and resilience in Bangladesh and the global south? Yeah, that's that's a very good question. I mean, I think it really illustrates um, the fact that we are dealing with um, an interdisciplinary and sometimes a transdisciplinary um, issue here. Um, I think we've seen a move. Um, so if we go back a few years, people were, were talking, oh, this is a multidisciplinary problem. We need to work with colleagues in social science. I used to go to so many meetings where um, those exact phrases were talked about. Um, and it was kind of it was a bit worrying because we don't want to do multidisciplinary science. We want to do at the very least interdisciplinary science. We want to produce something together with other disciplines. And we don't just want to talk about social scientists. Um, that's like talking about physical scientists and assuming they're all the same. No, they're not. We need a, a whole range of different disciplines. We need to understand people's behavior. We need to understand the psychology of that, what works in communication, how decisions are made, what are the politics um, around that? How does the economics work on a, on a core scale and on a, 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 a micro scale? Um, and that's even before I've started sort of adding in the, the engineering disciplines. Um, how well does it work? Um, I, I can probably say first from the, the UK. Um, I think there are examples of when it works really well, but there are not enough of them. Um, and I think there's still too much siloing of the dis different disciplines. There's too much viewing of a linear chain of starting with the physical science, um, passing that to an impact scientist, passing that to maybe an economist and an engineer. Um, it's getting better and so there are more projects um, that are becoming interdisciplinary. Um, but it, it's actually an area where the earlier question about funding becomes very relevant because it's easier to, to get funded, deep dive into any one discipline and show how you're advancing the science for instance, maybe we're understanding better how heat is mixed into the into the ocean or how resolution can affect a tropical cyclone um, than it is the interdisciplinary science. And I think that that still presents a barrier. Um, there are projects. Um, I've come from a meeting earlier today for one in the UK, um, the UK Climate Resilience um, Programme, um, and that's trying to do exactly this. It's trying to bring different communities together. Um, we have joint activities. Um, we make sure people from this range of disciplines are getting involved in the same project. Um, we are trying to view problems through different lenses. So it's happening. Um, how is it happening in international development um, projects and in the global south? Um, actually, um, you're probably better at answering that than uh, than I am, um, but I'll give one reflection. Um, I was involved in a, a project that looked at sea level rise um, for small island states um, a, a year or so ago, and the type of um, the type of interdisciplinary work that was feeding back from that project was incredibly impressive um, and. Actually, I think in many cases it took the view of putting um, the user first and then starting with those disciplines that um, help to um, help to bridge the communication gap even before the physical scientist was getting involved. Um, and there are certainly lessons um, we can we can learn in the UK from from that. Thank you very much. Yes, I think this. Um this move towards more transdisciplinarity 
in the work that we do, I, I would say, is a, is a steep learning curve for climate scientists to get on board with. But it is one that I, I am 100 percent on board with now, um, given some of our work, uh, particularly in uh, southern Africa with one of the Future Climate for Africa programs. Um, so that is maybe one example of where we are trialing out this transdisciplinarity in the global south. But as you say, there's still a long way for us to go to make this um, an effective way of working. And we're learning every day with the way that we do this. So it's exciting times, I think. <laughs> so we are out of time right bang on the minute now, which is fantastic. This has been a, a great discussion. And I just want to personally thank um, Professor Huck, Dr. Mizan and Professor Lowe for your time today. It's been really, really appreciated. Um, and I think all of the participants will have um, benefited from your expertise here today. And I will pass back to Joe for the final closing remarks. That's great. Thank, thank you so much, Tammy. And yes, thanks again to to the, the panelists um, uh, for for the previous session. Um, I'll say I say a, a few more words in closing in a second. But first, I want to give um, uh, Professor Saifal Islam a chance to to provide some closing reflections uh, and remarks on the webinar today. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, it was really excellent. Uh, uh, day and we had a very good discussions with uh, many distinguished panelists. Uh, we saw Professor Salim Lark, Dr. Mizan, uh, Professor Jess Lowe, and so many other people joined today. And uh, we tried to present the latest science uh, that we have. Uh, we uh, so far done. We have lots of limitations uh, that already uh, shown. That limitation of not availability of the data limitations of not availability of stations. So the research is difficult. It's not always easy to carry out such research, but within that context, like I saw some of the um, commented uh, participants already mentioned that how it will happen about how sediment load is going to impact the sea level rise and so many other directions that we still not able to research. And the, there are also questions like how polder are going to affect, uh, how we can raise, how can we adapt our life with the <laughs> threat of climate change. Uh, so all this uh, I think is a big uh, challenging uh, factor for upcoming years, even, even beyond 2100 that the latest production of IPCC, you will see that sea level will continue to rise. So I will not uh, continue and I like to thank Darren and Ben and Jennifer for excellent and also Tami, of course, uh, for excellent organization of this meeting uh, before the COP26 meeting. And uh, all this actually a good collaboration over the years with UK Metaphys Headley Center. I still remember my previous uh, uh, other colleagues like Vashkaran, David Hain and others who helped Bangladesh on capacity building using the precise regional modeling. So all this actually uh, a long term collaboration since I remember 2018 uh, 2008 when I was in University of Readings to take a short course on uh, presses. <laughs> so uh, this is really good uh, support for Bangladesh and uh, we are very glad uh, the way Metaphysics is uh, assisting this current science and modeling and hopefully you will continue and uh, this is very crucial for the country. So I stop here. I like to thank all of you and your colleagues and all the presenter and participants for, for hearing. Yes, many thanks, Saifal. And um, yes, it's as you say, it's building on on existing collaborations and hopefully from this webinar today, um, new connections and, and potentially new collaborations in the future can can um, form and build on on existing ones as well. So. Um, yes, yeah, so per personally, I, I found the, you know, the talks and the discussion really fascinating today. Um, it demonstrates that there's, you know, a vast amount of knowledge in this area, um, but it's that it's continuing to to grow. And, and we, we heard about a range of different modeling approaches, but also the need for that sort of dialogue amongst communities um, and that question at the end about different uh, 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 roles of researchers as well, um, but also working with with those um, who are uh, in, in different different parts of, of addressing these challenges, uh, whether at national government, local local government, or um, or, or in working in, in other areas as well. Um, so th thanks to um, the, the speakers and uh, the panelists and and the, and the session chairs, uh, Tammy and Seifel, today for your time and and for everyone's valuable contribution. Um, a special thanks to Jenny Weeks, um, who's helped to uh, organise the webinar today. So we really appreciate your efforts. 
Um, and of course, thanks for everyone for, for attending. Um, the, this is being recorded, as you know, and so we're going to follow up and make the link available to, to anyone who wasn't able to attend. So when we share that, please do, do share it with your, with your colleagues. Um, and we'll also include a summary of this uh, and, and the link on the ARC website uh, where uh, further outputs can be, can be found from the program. Um, so the, 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 I didn't mention at the start that the ARC program is running until August 2022. So, so uh, watch this space for, for further events and, and outputs over the next um, 18 months or so. Um, and with that, um, yeah, just want to say thanks again and I'll close the webinar. Um, wishing you all the best. Uh, yeah, please stay safe and uh, thanks again for attending today. So thanks everyone and, and goodbye. Thanks very much. That was great.